changes. So it helps uh, a lot of programs, women's programs, youth programs, things like that. I would hope that you want to come. We'll have, as we get the, our flyer made up, we'll bring those here and we'll hand them out here so that you have notice. If anyone wants to be on the committee and help out, we would love to have you. We're having a committee meeting, our kickoff committee meeting, tomorrow night right here. Um, it'll be in the restaurant site because they have bingo back in here. But, um, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. If you want to help us, we'd love to have you come on the committee and help us out. It's for a great cause, and, and we appreciate any help you can give. Anybody have any questions? I answered, I said everything, nobody's gonna go, okay. Last chance. All right, thank you. Dangerous. With all these shootings that uh, have come up lately, I, I think it's really extremely important that we make sure that we contact our state legislators, our federal legislators, and tell them our thoughts on preserving our rights. The antis are just absolutely, they're just coming up like mushrooms all over with all kinds of gun bills. And Bloomberg is throwing millions of dollars into these things, especially, and I guess Soros is too. And we, we can't compete with the money that they're spending, but we believe in, I think, our rights to say we're here a lot more than they do. And I think it's very important that we, <laughs> we we convince our legislators how important it is to to re preserve our rights and don't let these guys overwhelm us. Maybe when Margot's talking, she could mention how legislators feel about getting phone calls and that. But uh, make sure you renew your memberships to ISRA, NRA, and any of your friends. Make sure you make sure that they do it also. It, it's we thought we got concealed carry. A lot of people just, oh, we're fine. I don't have to join ISRA anymore or NRA. And the membership and both organizations started to go down literally the month after we got concealed carry. And I think we face a, a much larger threat than we ever have. So I, I think it's very important to be very active so we can maintain our rights. Can I say one thing, Doug? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, in the wake of Las Vegas, ISRA was really proactive on this, and you know there were some bump stock bills that came out there from the antis. Well, the, strat the strategic decision by ISRA was to have our own bump stock bill. And I got some feedback from people who were beyond furious with me because I was on this bill. But you need to understand that this is a strategic play. This was a bill that was prepared in conjunction with ISRA by your lobbyist in Springfield to provide a place for those of us that are in that are going to fight for your second amendment rights to say this is the bill that we're on you keeping in mind no bill will ever see the light of day <coughs> the bill that came up was just a piece of junk bill um, that was never going to pass so you know don't think that we're naive or that we're being, um, uh, that I didn't understand exactly what that bill was and what it was doing and why I was on it. So don't think that I'm out there trying to ban bump stocks, people. Don't write me hateful letters. That's not the way it is. It's a strategic, thoughtful, consensual um, uh, way of neutralizing our foes and taking the wind out of their sails. So, you know. There's communication between ISRA and your Second Amendment representatives and senators in, in Springfield to be strategic about this. So, yeah. I appreciate <laughs> your saying that because I have said that to a lot of people. Yeah. And they have this thing that the ISRA was selling them out. And I said, yeah. that bill's never going to see the light of day. The point is it gave you a place to go to not voting on the other. Right. And, and you know, for those people that did call, I get way more calls in my district, which is a very conservative district, Frankfurt, Mokina, New Lenox, a little bit of Orland, Tinley, Lockport, um, Homer, and Joliet. It's a very conservative district. I have way, way, way more calls, emails, and communication from Second Amendment proponents. I do get calls from opponents. Um, I have, I think, two 
Moms Demand Action, is that their name? Yep. The anti-gun moms, I think there are two in the district, but um, they both contacted my office and we were able to say, oh, she's on that bill, don't worry about it. You know, she's on the good, you know, a really good, so, you know, it's not, it's not without thought. I don't want people to think that I just went off on some frolic and detour and abandoned, you know, my, my decades long commitment to the second amendment. No, it wasn't like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and ISRA, we got uh, a bunch of calls. How could you do this? And yeah. How yeah. could they do that and everything? And uh, no, no. And that's why she's speaking. I to explain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, All right. Be more appropriate, I guess. So. Okay. I'll let go, and then you can introduce me. As long as we're talking about heresy, um, <laughs> those of you who know me probably should put a seatbelt on because. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> But it works out. It's going to be okay. Don't panic. Um, I'm actually uh, a key member of a committee to get a Democrat elected. Oh, what? I know. I know. Uh, but let me tell you what it is. Is anybody here from Cook County? We don't have anybody here. Are you from Cook County? Anybody else? Okay. So you like Tom Dart real well, do you? So there's a gentleman. Um, his name is John Fairman. And John uh, is, is a, a black guy, and he is a uh, criminal defense attorney. Does a lot of gun cases, South Side, where there are a lot of gun cases. John was born and raised in Texas. And John is the most Second Amendment friendly guy you are ever going to meet. He, in fact, the first thing he said to me when we started talking, I, I met with him for about half a day. The first thing he said when we started talking about business is he goes, no law-abiding person who is in possession legally of a firearm should have to worry about going into Cook County. So here's the interesting part about John. <laughs> and here's the interesting thing about Tom Dart that hasn't been made public yet, but it is going to come out. Um, he's going to be very vulnerable. About three weeks ago, he cold cocked his wife. Oh. oh what? Now, the police went off radio, so there's no record of it. But there are plenty of people who know about it, and it's going to come out at a strategic time, I'm sure. Um, Trek Winkle, who has never been a Second Amendment lover, um, has never gotten along with Tom Dart. She is the person that has asked John to run for sheriff, knowing that he's a Second Amendment guy. But she views him as better than Tom Dart. So if, if John were to get elected, you would have in Cook County a very hardcore Texan pro-Second Amendment sheriff, which would be a first, and would be the first black sheriff in Cook County, which has a high percentage of persons of color. Um, and we're looking at it like it's hard to imagine him not not getting in. I mean, when when Prep Point herself is endorsing him, um, and with all that's going to happen. So I just throw that out since there's only two of you who are Cook County people. But how long has Cook County had an anti-gun sheriff? Too long. Forever. Yeah. Now. Okay. So I can tell you that John um, John Fairman is very definitely a pro-gun guy. And, uh, and the gun use arrest will go up, and the harassing of people, law-abiding citizens, who have permits <laughs> to carry and have firearms legally will go down. Right now, I know, and I'm sure you know, that if the deputies stop you and you have a gun, they'll arrest you, just because that's what Tom Dart wants. And, and you shouldn't blame the deputies, because most, most cops are pro-gun, not all, but most cops are not anti-gun people. But if your boss tells you you're going to do it. You're going to do it because that's your job, and that that directive would change under uh, John Fairman. So I just want to point that out. I know most of you aren't Cook County, but we will probably have to come in and try and get him to come in and talk before the heat of the election season. Uh, very interesting guy. He really is a very interesting guy. Any questions about that? It's, so yes, I'm helping a Democrat. I know that. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to do that with any more though. I, I'm very selective in my Democratic friends, yes. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Right. As long as they stay in Cook County. Sir? <laughs> as long as they stay in Cook, Cook County. County. Exactly, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, anything else? 
Okay, Margo, you ready? I'm ready. So uh, take the hot seat. Uh, the uh, seat okay. David, um, got a yes, sir. Uh, there is only one issue that to me is most important. You know, there's, there's a lot of issues in the election. But I do think the most important one to me is, is the person pro-life. And so uh, I know this gentleman you're talking about is running for sheriff. He's not probably going to be involved in harassing uh, people who are counseling abortion clinic visitors, etc. But I still want to say, from my point of view, pro-life trumps everything else. Well, and, and that's, that's a good point. The thing about law enforcement is, is this. It's not supposed to be political. Um, those sorts of issues, because I feel the same way, but those sorts of issues really don't impinge the sheriff's office. In other words, if you're, if you're voting for the county official, that's a different issue, because they do. But the sheriff enforces laws that are on the books. And, and as he has said, and, I, and other sheriffs have said that I've talked to, it's not up to the sheriff to decide if somebody should be arrested just for the sake of arresting them to harass them. You should just enforce the laws the way they are, black or white. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and that's basically his position. So, yeah, I mean, he's a Democrat. I didn't go into any other subject other than those that pertain to law enforcement, because that's all, all that he's got. Yeah, I agree. Anybody else? So, Maro McDermott is going to be speaking. She's in, uh, in the uh, representatives the side of the legislature. And this will be the last one of our uh, little fireside chats on how to interact with government. Um, oh, real quick before uh, we do that, uh, Eric, I'll just go ahead and bring her. Do you want to say something? Do you want to say, talk about it? I can. Go ahead. Okay. So next month is, um, is show and tell. I'm not just the guy that, you know, controls the wires and the video and stuff. I'm also a chief NRA range safety officer. So we're going to have a little bit of a safety component to, or a little more of a safety component to the show and tell. So when you come in, we're going to have an area set up where you can unload and show clear. And then if you have a chamber flag, bring that with you. If you don't, we'll have some. We'll give you a chamber flag to put in your firearm. Um, if anybody else here is a range safety officer, um, see me. Um, I wouldn't mind an extra hand. Is anybody? Maybe. Okay. Okay, great. So we can get a couple people together and figure it out. That's it. If you've not been here in December before, you can bring in whatever you want for show and tell. I mean, sort of gun related. It's, uh, you know, you've got to be a little careful when I say that. <laughs> okay, any questions about it before we start? All right, so these, uh, they're all, uh, you can find these on YouTube if you want to go back and watch them or if you have friends who want to go back and watch them. So, uh, Argo, you're on. Okay, thanks everybody. My name is Margo McDermott. I'm a state representative for the 37th district here in Illinois. So that's parts of Frankfurt, Mokina, New Lenox, Orland Park, Tinley Park, Lockport, Homer Glen, and a little tiny bit of Joliet. I was first elected to that position three years ago, so I'm halfway through my second term. And Dave asked me tonight if I would talk to all of you about how a bill becomes a law, with particular attention to how you all can interact with the process. And I don't know about you, but it's been a long time since I took civics class. I think we took it in fourth grade when I was, I think nowadays it's fifth grade, right? But anyway, it's been a long, long time. So I really was not aware of all the ins and outs and just how difficult it is and how many moving parts there are to the process until I got down there and tried to learn it myself. And until you've been the, through the whole cycle, which is, January when we start working um, through May 31st when we're supposed to be done with our budget, um, it's pretty hard to understand how intricate the process is. Now I thought for an example that we would use tonight, I would use not a gun bill. Because if I use a gun bill, you guys want to all get in the weeds and talk about all the little details about the bill and, I, and we'll lose um, the process worrying about the substance of the bill. So, and the other reason I don't want to use a gun bill is that really since I've been there, no gun bills have gone through the legislature because um, concealed carry and the um, decades long process 
that resulted in Illinois having a concealed carry was before I got there. So, and, it, and one of the things that you'll see happens is once a decision is kind of made and a, a big bill like that passes, they don't want to revisit that. In particular, Mike Madigan doesn't want to hear about it anymore. <coughs> like school funding, we had a new school funding formula in August. You won't hear about another big school funding change for a long, long time. The last one was between 20 and 30 years ago. So that's one of the things that kind of happens with these. So the, the example I want to use is the example of the Beagles. And the way this Beagle bill came up is a way that a lot of bills come up. A constituent of mine, someone that lives in Mokina, adopted a Beagle that had been used in a lab for research purposes. <clears throat> and she found out that there's a nationwide movement to make sure that when these beagles are done being used for experiments, that they be put up for adoption as opposed to what often happens or has happened in the past, which is they, they are euthanized, whether or not they're in good or bad health. And so there's, there, was a, there was a bill called the Beagle Freedom Bill that she asked me to bring. So I said, okay, Sandra, you're a good friend of mine. I've met Francis, your beagle, I'll bring this bill. So, the first thing you do when an idea comes forth, and this is a way that you can all interact, is come to me or to your representative and say, here's a really good bill, Margo, I want you to bring this. An example that came forward last year was, can um, active duty military have the same concealed carry permits that an Illinois resident has when they're in Illinois, which right now they do not have under our concealed carry bill. I did bring that bill last year, it went exactly nowhere. But, you know, don't be shy, bring me some bills on guns or any other topic. Beagles, uh, whatever, zoning, whatever might be uh, an issue that's on your mind. So, an idea comes forward very often from a constituent, or sometimes from a headline. Here's another bill that I'm going to bring. Did you know that you can't bring sunscreen to school? It's on an FDA controlled list. So your child or your grandchild cannot bring sunscreen to school. So I don't think that's a very good bill. Uh, for someone that's melanin ch challenged like me, I think that we should have um, sunscreen in school. So I'm going to bring that bill. So, you know, ideas come from anywhere. That's the point. Um, it could come from you, from the rep themselves, from an industry or an organization like the NRA or the ISRA. And then I have staff. There is staff in Springfield that will write the bill up in proper... Uh, bill language and um, then once it's written up by them and it really has to go through them you can file it um, the usual time for filing bills is January but there's nothing to say that you can't file a bill any time of the year there's no real, real prohibitions on that um, we did see some new bills for example um, this bump stock bill that we were talking about earlier tonight that was filed during veto session or the new uh, resolutions and bills about um, sexual harassment that all of a sudden came top of mind when we had a senator doing what he shouldn't have been doing to an Illinois lobbyist. Um, so that was also filed in veto session. So usually bills are filed in January because the, we usually are working January to May, but you can file it any time of the year. There's not any prohibition on that. So don't be shy, bring forward your ideas. And then all the bills go to um, rules committee. Now, you wouldn't really think that that was much of a deal, but in the state of Illinois, rules committee is everything um, in the Illinois House. Rules committee is where Michael J. Madigan, the Speaker of the House, and his staff literally read every bill, literally try to find out what's behind every bill, and make a decision about whether that bill is going to be assigned to a committee or whether it's just going to sit in rules committee forever. Um, most bills, many, many, many bills, and all Second Amendment bills, really, and any bill that the governor wrote or that Jim Durkin wrote or uh, any bill with regard to workers' comp reform or ethics reform or uh, government transparency will never be let out of Rules Committee. So that's the first hurdle, is is your bill going to come out of Rules Committee and get assigned to a substantive committee? Um, I should have looked up how many committees we have, but there are quite a few. 
um, I'm going to say 60 or 70 different committees in the House. So there's Transportation Committee, Healthcare Licenses, Judiciary Criminal, Judiciary Civil, um, what are some of the other ones? Uh, financial Institutions, all sorts of committees to deal with all the different um, issues. Human Services Committee. Um, education committee, higher education committee. So depending on what your bill, what your bill deals with is where it would be assigned. Now what happened with the Beagle bill, it did come out of rules committee and it did get assigned to higher education committee because guess what? Much of the research that's being done on um, animals in the state of Illinois is being done by our universities. We do have um, corporations, pharmaceutical corporations in our state, which you also do research with the animals. But a lot of it is being done by the universities, and they really, 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 really hate, and I didn't find this out until I filed the bill, hate anybody interfering with their ability to do as they want to in their, uni in their laboratories. It was the opposition that was created by filing this bill with the universities was quite, quite large. And so that brings us to the next step, which is when your bill is assigned to committee, then the, uh, it will get a hearing. And so what happens at the hearing is um, people will come and testify for or against the bill. Um, in this case, the universities are about how this is going to suppress <coughs> development of new drugs. Um, it would impact uh, in a negative way our ability to create new drugs, and they named off many, many drugs that were um, benefiting all of us that were, were created using animal research, and so on and so forth. And um, some of the folks from the Beagle Freedom, which is a national organization, came and with their beagles, which were not allowed into the building, but were <laughs> photographed outside, and um, came and testified as well. Um, and the bill did not come out of committee. Um, the thing to know about committees is that there are more members of the majority party than the minority party on all the committees. And um, so they, and the other thing you need to understand about the majority party in the state of Illinois is that they, they do as instructed. We Republicans are a little wilder. We do not have that much um, control, notwithstanding what people may say about <coughs> us. Um, we are kind of free agents and we're, it's like herd, herd, getting us to agree on anything is like herding cats. Democrats do what they're told to do. So if they're told not to let the bill out of committee, they don't let it out of committee. Um, and so uh, that's what happened with the bill the first year. So another thing you need to understand is that just because it fails one year, you bring it back. Many, I mean, we know this uh, from concealed carry. You don't let one defeat knock you down. You come back, come back, come back, tinker with it, bring new allies, bring pressure, figure out what the um, what points of influence you have and leverage you have to make to bring your bill forward. So. Just because it doesn't have a favorable reception the first time is not a reason to let it go. So fast forward to the next year, and the bill, in the meantime, uh, some of the lobbyists, um, we'll come back to lobbyists in a minute, worked over the summer with the universities and got language that the universities agreed on. So this last year, um, the bill was filed again with some changes and because it was now an agreed bill where there was no opposition to the bill as it was, it came through committee. Once it passes through committee, then it goes onto the floor of the House. Every bill has to be read three times. I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think back in the very old days, they were literally read three times so that the legislators could listen to them. Nowadays, you know, because of computers and so on, you, nobody listens. They actually don't read the bills when we're there. They read the bills on days when we're not there. They do read them into the record, but we're not sitting there listening to them. Uh, if you want to read the bill, you go online and read the bill. Um, but, there's, but I think in the old days, they actually used to sit and read the bills. So they have to be read three times in order for them to be passed. And then when your bill comes up on third reading, um, it's your job to stand up and talk to the bill 
In other words, persuade the, there are 118 of us representative, persuade the other 117 to vote for your bill. Um, having said that, almost no one's vote is changed on the floor of the House. Um, before people get to the floor to vote on a bill on third reading, you know what you're going to do on that bill because um, the lobbyists have been in to talk to you, the, your constituents have called you, written you, emailed you, visited your office and told you, Margo, we hate that bill. Margo, you have to vote for that bill. Or Margo, we're never going to vote for you again if you support that bill. So you've already made up your mind by the time you get to, uh, usually, to the floor of the House. And I, I promise to talk about lobbyists, so I will. Um, one of the jobs of the lobbyists is to run around and make sure that the 118 people know what's coming up that's important to their constituents. Um, the lobbyist for the ISRA right now is, I think, Ed Sullivan, right? If I'm, if I'm correct, Ed Sullivan, who used to be a rep. And so uh, it's Ed's job to find out how all 118 people feel about this particular bill. And they take a, um, they'll take a tally. You know, they'll, they'll have a list of the, all the 118 names and they'll be like McDermott, yes, McDermott, no. Um, uh, Batnick, yes, Batnick, no, you know, so that they know, so they'll have a roll call uh, going in. Most times before a bill is called for third reading, the sponsor knows how that, what's going to happen with that bill. You don't just call it on a whim and a prayer hoping that somehow by some miracle it's going to pass. You have the um, other proponents of the bill or else it's something like sexual harassment. Well, there's nobody in the floor that's going to vote no against having uh, more um, assurances that there cannot be sexual harassment of you know uh, people in Springfield. So you know some stuff like that, but any kind of a gun bill or something like the Beagle bill, um, you want to have your roll call ahead of time so you know what's going to happen. Um, so uh, it might get voted up, or it might get voted no. If it votes, if it gets voted up, then it goes on to the Senate. And just like bills can be filed for the first time in the House, a bill could originate in the Senate. And what happens a lot of times is the same bill is filed in the House and the Senate so that you have two chances of getting that bill through because it might go faster in the Senate. You know, their committee might be faster. It might get to committee faster. They might have more favorable um, testimony, uh, more the, the timing for the testimony of the hearing in the Senate might be better so that they, it just moves quicker. Um, or sometimes the House bill might, the House version might move faster. Um, if you have a fair amount of clout and you really feel strongly about your bill, you try to file it in the House and the Senate. So that way you've got twice as much opportunity to get that thing going and get it moving. Because if you can get it through one House, then you have a better chance of it getting through the second House. Um, you know, so you want to try, that way you've got, you know, it could get through the Senate first and then go to the House, or it could get through the House first and then go to the Senate. If you only file it one, it's only got one chance. That you have the same procedure in the Senate with committees, although I will say this, I don't think the Senate is quite as um, obnoxious about uh, rules committee. They actually are, you know, Cullerton, President Cullerton is not um, so autocratic and controlling. And many more things come out to committee and they're a little bit more um, open to discussing ideas. In the House, we don't necessarily even discuss ideas. We just, you know, some things you just can't even discuss. They can't even be going into committee because it's just so, I don't know, anathema to the speaker. Um, so uh, they have a little bit, it's smaller, it's more intimate, it's more, I will say they're more cooperative. In the House, we're very confrontational right now. It's, um, you know, pitched war between Rauner and Madigan. Um, the Senate is not quite so, they're, they're pretty partisan, but not quite so much. They are a little bit more collegial, a little bit more, we don't do any compromising in the House, really, but they do a little bit more over in the Senate. So that's um, uh, what the process is. In order for it to go to the governor, it has to be passed by both the House and the Senate. Um, and if one of the House, if either the House or the Senate makes amendments on what came to it from the other place, 
then um, <clears throat> it has to go back to the first um, place. And then if the Senate amends a bill that we sent to them, we have to vote and approve the amendments. Otherwise, it, it does not go to the governor, and vice versa. So you can't have two different versions of the same law. It has to be the same version. And that's <coughs> another way that you can get uh, different shenanigans going on. You can put unfriendly amendments on. You can put uh, poison pills on that you know the other, uh, uh, either the House or the Senate will not approve, um, and generally play politics in that way. Now, sometimes um, it's just an amendment that's an improvement or something that um, is necessary for everyone to agree and be able to move forward. So um, sometimes it's a good thing and it's an improvement to the law and to the bill, and sometimes it's just a way to kill the bill so that uh, uh, they get another crack at killing it, the people who didn't want the bill. So the second time around, because the Beagle Bill was then an agreed bill, we had only at this point covered the universities, not any private pharmaceutical companies. Um, and the universities were all in agreement on what the bill should contain, um, which basically is that if their veterinarian agrees that the dog or cat, it applies to cats as well, uh, is in good health, then um, uh, it will be put up to, for adoption in a program created by the university itself. They did not want like PETA or somebody being in charge of the adoptions and, and saying who could be adopted and who couldn't. So as long as their vet gets to do it, then that's what happened and that's what was passed and that what was is what was signed by the governor. Um, so it sounds kind of straightforward and although complicated and with many steps. It can be very difficult because a lot of bi bills that are proposed by Republicans or bills on topics that um, the speaker doesn't want to agree with, uh, for example, pension reform or workers' comp reform or more transparency in government, never see the light of day, are never debated. One of the biggest um, surprises and disappointments to me when I was elected and went down to be a legislator in Springfield is that we actually never talk about any really essential items. <clears throat> Anybody who lives in the state and reads the newspaper or listens to the evening know news knows what our issues are here. We need to work on the high cost of our government pensions. We need to do something to reduce the cost of our workers' comp program, which um, every single employer in the entire state says is a broken system that's too expensive. And this the workers' comp system, don't forget, applies to counties and you know our local police departments, not only private employers, but all our government, um, state and local agencies. When I was on Will County Board, it was a huge expense. Millions and millions and millions of dollars a year spent on workers' comp. So, you know, if we could reform that, that would help that would reduce our taxes, our tax burden, from our local taxing districts, and it would help bring more jobs, but we're not ever allowed to talk about that. Uh, pension reform is huge. 25% um, of our tax dollars right now are going to pensions, to pay state employee pensions. That's not sustainable. Um, I understand about the Illinois Constitution, and I understand about promises that were made to workers, but it's not possible to collect enough taxes to pay for these pensions. So we have to figure out a way to move forward. Uh, just like private employers did. You know, they worked with their unions and they figured out a way that everyone could move forward into the 21st century. And we're gonna have to do the same thing. And there are many good ideas. You would think, uh, if you read the paper or watch the evening news, that nobody in Springfield has actually come up with any ideas or solutions. But that's not true. There are many, many bills filed um, in Springfield to try to, you know, bring some um, changes or improvements or ways to reduce our pension liabilities or to change our workers' comp system. It's not only the cost in the system, but it's just the intricacy of the system that it takes so long that makes it very expensive as well. There are many bills trying to address those issues that never see the light of day. So I, I would like to see us work on essential things and not nice to have things. I mean, you know, 
having beagles that are used for research be adopted is a good thing. It's a nice thing. Is it essential for the welfare of the state of Illinois? No. So I would like to be able to say that I've been working on pension reform, that I've been working on workers' comp reform, that I've been working on making Illinois more business friendly with our tax environment or our, you know, um, the many, many label, layers of regulation, but, you know, that's just not what we're doing down there. So um, what else can I tell you? Do people have any questions about, about the system? There's got to be some questions out there. I suppose term limits is off the board, huh? Yeah, there are a lot of term limits. The question was, what about term limits? There are many bills with respect to term limits out there that have been filed that are sitting in rules committee um, that have not come out. Yeah, I think um, in one sense, you know, Mike Madigan always says, well, there's a term, there's a term limit every two years. There's an election every two years. Well, yeah, but <laughs> if you've given everybody in your district a job, it's kind of hard to see where that's going to go. Having said that, 25 members so far of the Illinois House are, re are not running in, in a year, in the next year. 25 members, 13 Republicans and 12 Democrats are not running. So that's, you know, out of 118, 25, somebody that's better at math can tell me. But that's approaching, to, you know, that's a fifth that's of the people. So um, there's some turnover for you. That'll be interesting to see. David. How do you, uh, if, if somebody wants to submit a bill for your consideration, how do they do that? Is there a format for it? How does that work? Well, the question is, how would you submit a bill idea to me? Um, here's how bills, uh, bill ideas are submitted to me. People come up to me here at the meeting and tell me, Margo, I think it would be a great idea too. I actually was at a meeting about six weeks ago and somebody came up to me with this super great idea. Why don't we have the coroners or the, actually the funeral directors was what she said, um, send copies of the death certificate to the um, county clerks who maintain the voter registration files for each county in the state of Illinois so they can take, you know, uh, John Doe or Jane Doe, who's just deceased, off the voting uh, rolls. That's a genius idea. Why didn't I think of that? So, you know, that's the kind of thing. And she just came up to me after a meeting and suggested that. So, you know, I'll give you a number after the meeting, or you can come up and give me your ideas here tonight. Um, people call me up with ideas. People send me emails with ideas. Um, I've had several business people come in with ideas about how to um, reduce um, the intricacy of the regulation that we have on business here in the state of Illinois to kind of streamline some of the regulations. And I brought two of those bills. They didn't go anywhere last year, but it caught the notice of the regulatory authorities in the state and also the um, other members of the industry that was being regulated. One case was um, liens, you know, um, uh, loan company liens. Um, and also um, contractor liens, mechanics liens on property. And the other one was uh, a mortgage loan processing issue. And um, I think both of those are gonna come back, they're gonna be um, redrafted to take into account some of the opposition or the points that was, were raised by the opposition last year and brought again this year, probably with a better result. So just because it wasn't successful the first year isn't a reason to uh, let it die, you know, let it come back and, you know, take into account what people were saying against it and revise it and bring it forward. So those are some of the ways. Um, sometimes I get ideas reading the newspaper. Like I filed a bill um, saying that you cannot be the leader of a political party in the state of Illinois and a legislative leader. When I read in the newspaper that the only um, place in the entire United States where one of the legislative leaders of their state house was also a political party leader, and that's Mike Madigan oh, and the yeah. Illinois Democrat Party, which I did not realize. I mean, we don't know what we don't know in Illinois because we're just here. And, you know, we've been living in this kind of, um, I would even say, 1960s political machine environment for so long, we don't even understand that nobody else lives like that. So. So I brought that bill. That will never come out of rules committee, but it was a good, it was a good bill to bring uh, because you know it highlights one of the problems that we have here in the state. 
And um, so that was just from reading the headline. The sunscreen was the same thing. Maryland just passed a law saying that you can bring <coughs> sunscreen to school, and I was reading that in the Wall Street Journal one day, and I'm like, well, what's the story in Illinois? And I find out we don't <coughs> permit our school children to bring sunscreen. So, you know, that bill's being written right now. So it's pretty easy. I, there's a question all the way in the back. Would you uh, explain the power of the witness slip? We get requests to fill out witness slips, and does that have a lot more? Slips. What is that request for the third, for the third reading, or what's that all about? Witness slips come along for committees. So when you find out that a bill you're interested in um, is in committee, or when ISRA finds out that a bill that they're interested in is in committee, they're going to put out, you know, an email blast telling people to <coughs> slip in. And you can go online and file the witness slips. And it is very important because they, they are read into the record. Um, all of them will be part of the record of that hearing in, uh, in that committee hearing. Um, I think a lot of the gun bills are in judiciary criminal, aren't they? So, you know, when they have a hearing about a gun bill, then all those names. Now, again, like the first, second, and third reading of the bill, they don't do it while the reps are there. Because, you know, if there's 500 slips, nobody wants to sit there while they read those in. But they will sit there afterwards, the staff, and read them into the record. And, and the chairman of the committee will get up and say, I have 500 opponents. And with your permission, we'll read them in after. Or I have 500, 500 proponents. So I would say they're very powerful. I would say going to Springfield and lobbying. Um, you know, when there's a big bill and there's a lot, a lot of people there about an issue that are crowding the halls and you can't get from my office over to the Capitol. And when, you know, people are coming, like on our Eigold Day, when everybody comes to my office and they leave me the postcard on my desk, because I'm usually either in a committee meeting or on the floor, although sometimes I see people there. Um, <coughs> You know, that's important. We want all the representatives to know who's watching them. It's very powerful. You know, and we have staff, we have secretaries that they keep a tally. They, and you know, they'll take your name and where you live. Um, and if I'll, for, um, I'm just trying to think. On this, I think I mentioned this earlier, I probably had maybe 70 contacts about no bump stock regulation and I had two for bump stock regulation, that's, that's very informative. Most representatives vote their district. So, and I think that's kind of important to realize. Um, on some things, you know, people don't. They will vote according to what the party tells them. But in many things, representatives do vote their district. So it's very important for them to understand what their district is telling them. You definitely want to be the squeaky wheel for sure, for sure. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to, to rank um, several ways that we can contact the representatives in Springfield. First is, you mentioned IGO. And now keeping in mind that, that many bills are going to come up that, that we may want to be a proponent of or opponent of, and we can't come down to Springfield every day to, to march the halls, could you rank in priority of importance for the committees between calling your representatives, witness slips, and eye gold, of those, if you could rate the most important way we can contact our representatives by <coughs> priority one through three. Well, a little bit of his timing, too. So when a bill is in committee, you know, contacting people, your representative, if that person is not on the committee, is kind of irrelevant. So, you know, if the bill is still in committee, then you would definitely want to do a witness slip and find out who the committee members are, maybe, and contact them. Or, um, and figure out who maybe some of the uh, pro or negative members of the committee might be. Um, and you can find out who's on any committee. There's our website that really has a ton of information. It's called ilga.gov. ILGA.gov, Illinois General Assembly.gov. And it's got a list of all the committees and who are the members. And then when you click on the member, it shows their address and their phone number. So, yeah. Um, 
until the bill comes out of committee, that's the most important place to, because, you know, if, if I'm not on the committee, I don't know about that bill. You know, I'm on six committees. There are 60 committees. So I don't know what's going on in the other 50, you know, unless it's some humongous bill that everybody knows about. But um, most of the day-to-day -day bills I won't know about until it comes onto the floor. So let's just, let's just put this as a, it's a gun bill. And yeah. We've been notified. Yeah. And so let's prioritize only contacting the committee members, not just you, if you're not on the committee, but committee members of that that are, that are going over that particular piece of legislation. And, you know, I think it's important, you know, I think I'm, particularly with gun issues, I'm going to walk back a little bit what I said. I think it's really important for this group to be on top of all the bills at all, you know, a lot of the time just because of the nature of this, of the Second Amendment and all the attacks on it. You guys need to be really vigilant at all times in the process. So, you know, I think people that, are, that aren't on the committee and that aren't going to see the bill, one of the problems we've got with a lot of the, well, the, the, the anti-gun bills tend to fly through committee, right? <laughs> you know, our bills, so you need, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you catch it early and it's still in committee, contact the committee members and make their life a living hell. But, you know, it's going to be, it's going to come out because it's going to be a partisan roll call, which means the Dems are going to vote yes and the um, R's are going to vote no. And so it's going to fly out onto the floor the first week. It'll be called the first week and it'll fly out onto the floor. And so then get with everybody. Um, most bills sit in committee for a month or two. You know, but the gun, the bills that they want to use to beat us over the head with will fly right out. And the other thing that they do is um, the speaker has an unlimited ability to substitute committee members. So let's just say that on a committee there are some downstate Democrats. You know those downstate Democrats have to be pro-Second Amendment or they will never go back to Springfield again. So they will be substituted out of committee. And they will not be there to vote, you know, so that they can't vote no. They'll just say, you know, I'm sending uh, Kathleen Willis up there. She's your number one opponent in the Illinois House. Um, we're just going to send Kathleen Willis into that committee to vote instead of Brandon Phelps or uh, uh, Jerry Costello. You know, that's the kind of thing. And that, that's what they do with all the bills that they want to, that, so that... You know, when I say Democrats do what they're instructed, even if they wanted to do something different, they don't have the opportunity because they get substituted out of committee. So most effective, one, two, three, what's most effective for committees? Um, to, or do all of them. What's most effective? Hmm. I think probably... Because everybody tallies the phone phone calls are pretty effective, I think. <clears throat> witness slips are, you know, I don't know how hard it. I've never filed a witness slip. Are they hard to do? No. no. Yeah. No. To file a witness slip. If they got 500 witness slips, that tells them something. But if you mm -hmm. locked up the phone lines, yeah, that could be. Yeah, yeah. Nobody. I mean, and the secretaries freaking hate it. <laughs> you know, they, and, they, and you know, if your staff is in a bad mood, because you know. <laughs> One thing that you, every single job in the state of Illinois, and I hope, 97% um, of all jobs are union jobs. So all the secretaries, you know, they, they are working 8.30 to 4. And by 8.30, I mean 8.30. I don't mean 8.28. And by 4, I don't mean 4.05, okay? And if, and they get their, what do they get, 45 minutes for lunch? So, you know, it, <laughs> Let's just say their work ethic is not, I'm not saying that they don't do their work. They do their work, but that's all they do. And so if you make them work really hard on a given day, as opposed to just kind of having an average day and answering 10 phone calls, not good. <laughs> so they're all millennials you're telling us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's an interesting thing. No, there's not a lot of... It's their union jobs, and it's seen all seniority, so our secretaries skew older. I mean, there are some young women, but, you know, one th interesting thing about 
about Springfield is people who tend to work in politics, even though we have many, many, many young people and many, many millennials, they're all there because they want to be there, whether they're a Dem or they're a Republican, they're passionate about politics. And you, it's very difficult to get those jobs. You don't get any of that. I mean, they're all just like representative, representative, representative. What can I do for you? I'm talking about staff now, not the secretary. Staff that work for, you know, uh, Jim Durkin or Mike Madigan. They would, they, they are like tigers. So I'm a little bit insulated from that whole millennial thing. And the secretaries tend to skew. They're, they're in their 40s and 50s. So <laughs> make them make them answer. David, another question. Um, I don't quite understand veto session because in the veto session, I've seen them introduce bills. I don't quite grasp what the purpose of the veto session. Well, the governor has uh, so much time after the bill is passed to act on it. Usually he has to act within 60 days or it becomes uh, law. So um, the veto session is scheduled after, you know, 60 days after, it's usually scheduled in October or November right. for us to act on <clears throat> things that we might want to override, things that the governor vetoed. But you'll notice this time in particular, we had some bump stock bills, we had a number of provisions with respect to sexual harassment, we'll come back to that in a minute. And um, I'm trying to think if we had anything else that was, there were several other things that were promised but didn't materialize. So you could just, even though it's a veto session, you can just introduce a bill. You can introduce a bill any day, really. Yeah. Um, but it still has to go through the process right. that I've outlined. And rules committee and executive committee don't always meet. You know, like in, in August, they don't meet. So your bill's just going to sit there. Um, and there is a lot of fast and loose playing with the time requirements <laughs> for bills that are chosen bills. For example, the bump stock bill. Or um, the, bill, the other bill I'm thinking of is the... Um, uh, right to work bill where the where they're trying to get rid of what happened with um, what town Lincolnwood Lincolnshire whoever voted to have right to work in their village oh yeah and they were going and the bill was <clears throat> filed to criminalize if a if a village officials elected officials mayors and trustees vote to have have their village be a right to work village it's a misdemeanor that was the bill that was filed and that was heard I mean that's a crazy bill to take away local control like that. But anyway, um, then the, it flies through rules. It flies, there's a special meeting called of the committee. And some of the timelines, because there are, it's not written on here, but there are timelines. You know, there has to be an hour between when it's discharged from committee and when it's read the second time. And then there has to be like, you know, some more time before it's read for a third reading. They'll just waive all those timelines. But that's completely within the speaker's discretion. God forbid that any Republican would ask for any time uh, lines to be uh, waived at the speaker's discretion. They, every rule, every rule, and we have a good size rule book with, oh, I think around 100 rules in there, is at the speaker's discretion. So, you know, if you try to use the rules to try to, you know, get something discharged, say, for example, there's a rule that says you can get something discharged from a committee, but that's at the speaker's discretion, too. So. Yeah, it's a problem. Nikki. What about shell bills? Where oh. they run in the language the last minute. Okay, shell bills. That's a really good question. So every year, um, every January, a whole bunch of bills are filed that are called shell bills. And Speaker Madigan gets, I don't know, maybe 200. Jim Durkin gets 200. Cullerton gets 200. And... Um, Bill Brady, the Senate Minority Leader, gets a couple hundred. And what they do is it's a bill that'll, let's just say, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a really obscure bill, but let's just say, I don't know, the bill that sets the um, holiday schedule for the state, um, what day we're going to celebrate Veterans Day on, or something like that, say. Um, and they'll say, in the first... Uh, paragraph line three we're changing the comma to a period that's what the bill is and that's so, and then it's a shell and it'll be most of them are punctuation changes in existing laws and um, or they'll change a capital to a lowercase letter I mean it's just some kind of 
grammatical change like that to an existing law. And those will just sit out there. And then later on in the year, if you need a vehicle, and um, you know, Jim Durkin also has, and Bill Brady also ha are given, you know, a couple hundred shell bills. So um, if there's some late breaking something, for example, this sexual harassment thing, you know, you could just put that on a, a shell bill. And another thing that happens is the Senate will pass a bill about something and we'll just take it and shell it out and use it for our own purposes. Um, so that happens too. And that's a lot of the bills that you saw in veto session were shell bills that were used that way. So when do you find out what the content of the bill actually is? You gotta pass it. No, no, you get, when it's, <laughs> when the, when, when House Floor <laughs> Amendment Number 1 is filed and you look and then, you know, you get a chance to read it, but sometimes you have like an hour to read it and it might be something complicated. I mean, it's bad. It's, you know, there are some big things that you don't, the budget, for example, that we didn't have a chance to read. We're only now finding out some of the crap in the budget. Well, it's bad. <laughs> Other questions? Do we have, because I think we're right. Yeah, one question. Doug. I, I think I know the answer to it, unfortunately, but how do we stop what Madigan is doing with, with stopping all these bills from coming out? Explosives. Lots of explosives. <laughs> all right, the question is how do we stop uh, the procedure we have now with the leader really um, not, per not permitting bills to come out? Um, well, we complained about it so bitterly last year when we adopted the rules um, that he let out an avalanche of bills. Now, no bills about any of the, to the really important topics like pension reform or workers' comp reform, but he let out a whole bunch of bills <clears throat> because we just complained so bitterly and at such great length on the record about how Rules Committee didn't let anything out that he let out you know all the bills at once so now you have to be at like five committee meetings at once you know to present your bills in front of these committees but of course then he told the committees don't let any of the bills come out of your committee assign them to a subcommittee so yeah i didn't even talk about subcommittees so the committees can form subcommittees <laughs> and if your bill is ever assigned to a subcommittee that means your bill is assigned to the trash can. <laughs> so this year, really a lot of Republican bills came out of Rules Committee and got assigned to subcommittee. And it made us so damn mad that, remember when Mark, we're, I don't know if anybody paid any attention, but Mark Batnick didn't vote on any bills for like a month. Yeah. Because he was like on strike because of that behavior. And I went a whole day and didn't vote on any bills. And that was why, because all our bills were just assigned to a subcommittee. So the whole, um, what's the right word, oppression or suppression of Republican bills move from rule committee to the com all the committee subcommittees. So it's just like a, it's a whack-a-mole. <laughs> you gotta, it's, it's complicated, people. The, the most interesting lesson I've ever seen for me on the state legislature was when they were debating um, concealed carry. A Republican would ask a Democrat why they wanted to do something and they had no idea why they said it. Some guy would run up to them and put a three ring binder in front of them, go to the right page, they'd look down and read the page and they would answer the question. They had no idea what they were talking about. That's quite frequent. Um, the, a good example that happened last week was this bill that I had previously mentioned about right to work, about banning right to work, a village making its village a right to work village and that being a misdemeanor. And the um, sponsor of that bill was a guy named Marty Moylan, who's a representative out of Des Plaines. And um, literally the staffer, the Democrat staffer, was standing in front of Marty telling him what to say. And Marty was reading lips and repeating that as the answers to the questions. This is quite, quite common on the other side of the aisle. There isn't any Republican that I've ever seen that needed to have a staffer in their ear answering the questions for them. And sometimes we'll just, if you ever watch often enough, sometimes we'll call them on it and we'll say, would you just like to have your staffer answer my questions, Representative? And you know, then they'll, so um, it's, it, it, it's not uncommon on their side of the aisle for them. And a lot of times 
the person who brings the bill is not the person whose idea the bill was, but the person who needs to be the sponsor of that bill for that person's reelection mailers. So that's why you saw, saw Marty, Marty Moylan, because you know it's a very conservative area, so he's got to have some, and that's why you have people that really shouldn't be sponsoring any complicated bills as sponsors of bills. Is Madigan just writing them all, his people? He has a lot of staffers. Is Madigan writing the bills? Um, I don't mean personally, but he's, is he saying, we're going to do this bill, it's being written, and then they're saying, you're going to present it? Yes, that's exactly what happens. Madigan figures out with this, look at all the sexual harassment stuff. Why didn't Michael J. Madigan all of a sudden jump on sexual harassment? Is it because he's so worried about the women and his staff? <laughs> uh, that's a rhetorical question. Um, so, and um, I think he probably knows what's in those 27 complaints. I think that's why he's out ahead of that so quick. Um, and why he had so many mem male members of his team talking in favor of that bill. What's that all about? Very interesting. Not that I'm, you know, not going to vote for those bills. Certainly, we shouldn't have sexual harassment on, you know, anywhere in the state capitol. But, you know, that was all political. All political. That's, it's a real, if you weren't already cynical when you get to Springfield, you will be cynical. <laughs> and you've got to have a height like an armadillo. So, <laughs> to have that job. Yeah, um, and you can see it's complicated to learn. I feel that after being there three years that I have a good grip on what's happening. And I think it's taken me three full years to really feel completely comfortable with all the ins and outs of the bill process, the committee process, the debating on the floor process, the negotiating behind the scenes process. There's a lot to it. And who are the players? Who can help you? Who's sincere? Who's going to hurt you? You know, it's, it's a lot of moving parts. It's very complicated. There's a lot of power, a lot of people, you know, wanting to... Uh, uh, keep that power or take your power. It's um, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm always happy to answer your questions. And I'll have Dave uh, passing out the numbers for your bill ideas. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Margo. Thanks, Margo. Appreciate it. I appreciate all your support.